I think I could turn and live with animals. They're so placid and self-contained. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. No one is dissatisfied. No one is demented with the mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another, nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one is respectable or unhappy over the earth. Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass. Good evening. This is Atheist History Week, and I'm John Rafferty, President of the Secular Humanist Society of New York, and a proud and active member of New York City Atheists, which produces this show. Each week at this time, we look at the week's anniversaries in the history of free thought, atheism, agnosticism, secularism, humanism, skepticism, rationalism, what have youism. We discuss notable people, the famous and the not so, who were born or died or achieved something significant in regards free thought during this calendar week. And this week, we're up to the last week in May. And we look at significant events that took place this week in history, court cases, publishing events, religious riots, burnings at the stake, and other faith-based fun and games. So let's start this evening with America's most famous and maybe best poet, Walt Whitman. Who was born May 31st in 1819, right in the neighborhood on Long Island. I uh, worked as a clerk, a teacher, a journalist, and a laborer. Uh, in his time, he was a closeted homosexual uh, and uh, worked most famously as a nurse tending the sick um, in horrible conditions during the Civil War on the northern side, of course. Um, he uh, wrote his masterpiece, Leaves of Grass, in uh, 1855. Uh, it pioneered free verse poetry and uh, has been called a celebration, a humanistic celebration of humanity. Um, he worked as a clerk in the Treasury Department after the war and uh, had a stroke that incapacitated him the last 20 years of his life. Um, but he watched uh, the Leaves of Grass go through nine editions and be one of the most popular books of the 19th century in America and was paid the ultimate compliment of being banned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on charges of immorality. Uh, was Whitman an atheist? The deist. He had vague ideas about, uh, well, I shouldn't call them vague. He had ideas about the, the soul of humanity, uh, things like that. But um, uh, he certainly was no churchgoer. He was certainly no believer in a Christian or any other kind of personal God. Each of us is inevitable, he wrote in Salut du Monde. Each of us is limitless. Each of us has with his or her right upon the earth. Each of us allows the per eternal purports of the earth. Each of us here as divinely as any is here. We are as divine as anyone here, including gods. When there are no more memories of heroes and martyrs, and when all life and all the souls of men and women are discharged from any part of the earth, then only shall liberty or the idea of liberty be discharged from that part of the earth and the infidel come into full possession. Congratulations, infidels. Um, that was uh, Whitman also from Leaves of Grass uh, in the section called To a Foiled European Revolutionaire. And I say to mankind, be not curious about God, for I, who am curious about each, am not curious about God. I hear and behold God in every object, yet understand God not in the least. They do make me sick discussing their duty to God, he said. 
of the religious. Uh, Walt Whitman, born May 31st, 1819. Much more contemporary, as a matter of fact, born May 22nd in 1926, is the Englishman George Albert Wells. Uh, who is known by his initials, G.A. Wells. Um, most of us do not know G.A. Wells. As a matter of fact, I didn't until I started doing the research for this program. Uh, a free thought Bible scholar, an emeritus professor of German uh, at the University of London, and uh, he is a uh, uh, major uh, scholar and critic of the Bible of the 20th and now 21st century. Um, he has written such books as The Jesus of the Early Christians, The Historical Evidence for Jesus, uh, Belief and Make-Believe, Critical Reflections on the Sources of Credulity, The Jesus Legend, The Jesus Myth, and The Jesus Puzzle. And so I think you might be able to figure out what his area of expertise is. Wells maintains that Jesus never existed either as a person or a divine. Uh, the Christian community and average minister tend to be about a century behind serious Christian scholarship, Wells uh, says. Uh, he notes that the legendary character of the virgin birth, for instance, was exposed as nonsense as far back as the 1830s, in the 1830s and yet people are still uh, talking about the virgin birth. Uh, G.A. Wells has been chair of the British Rationalist Press Association uh, for some time, and he said, I say I have no religious beliefs. I certainly think this life is all I have, and anybody ha and all anybody has. And I usually say it doesn't seem to me at all meaningful to ask the purpose of life. What purpose of life does a spider have? If a spider doesn't have a purpose, why should we? Of course, we all have our individual purposes, but that's quite different. Agreed. And about his subject, he says, nowadays you can say practically anything about Jesus without creating offense, so long as you admit he existed. There was no such person. Uh, I don't know if Professor Wells is correct about there never having been such a person, but about whether there was a God who lived on the earth and got crucified and came back three days later. Uh, I'll give you three guesses what my position is on that. Going back to the 19th century in America, uh, one of the other most uh, influential writers in America was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, who was born on May 25th in 1803. Um, there was a time leading up to the time when I was a kid when just about every middle class household had a bound volume of Emerson's essays. Emerson wrote and wrote and wrote, and I don't know anybody who's ever read them all. How he wrote them all, I have no idea. Uh, but um, Emerson uh, was an early uh, adherent of uh, Unitarianism. Uh, he was a Unitarian minister, as a matter of fact, of uh, the Second Church Unitarian. Um, but that church he left because they did uh, the Christian communion thing. And he said it is beyond my comprehension. Uh, he was the inspiration for a whole movement in America uh, uh, called Transcendentalism, which I really don't want to go into right now. Google it. Find out for yourself. More nonsense. Uh, he lived his life as a poet, a writer, and a lecturer. He inspired transcendentalism, but he never called himself one. Uh, but he did think in terms of something called an oversoul or a form of good that he believed existed in, uh, in human beings and in nature. 
But what he is most famous for um, are his epigrams. The one best known is A Foolish Consistency is the Hobgoblin of Little Minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. That last part of it is often left off, but I can't tell you how many times I've used it myself when people have told me that I am contradicting myself or I'm making a logical error. A Foolish Consistency is the Hobgoblin of Little Minds. Uh, as the Freedom From Religion uh, uh, website, where I do most of this research, points out, there are a lot of beautiful one and two liners. Oh, as man's prayers are a disease of the will, so are their creeds a disease of the intellect. The most tedious of all discourses are on the subject of the Supreme Being. The word miracle as pronounced by Christian churches, gives a false impression. It is a monster. It is not one with blowing clover and the falling rain. He demolished, did uh, uh, Emerson, the right-wing hypocrites of his era, and we could apply this directly to the hypocrites of our era. <sighs> Worship, he said. The louder he talked of his honor, the faster we counted our spoons. And I hate this shallow Americanism which hopes to get rich by credit, to get knowledge by raps on midnight tables. To learn the economy of mind by phrenology, you know, rubbing the head for the bumps, or skill without study, or mastery without apprenticeship. The things that are seen by the divines are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. It is an affront upon nature. And a lesson for us in these times when we are all being, let me think of the correct verb here, screwed will have to do by the marketplace. The god of the cannibals will be a cannibal, of the crusaders a crusader, and of the merchants a merchant. Ralph Waldo Emerson, born 1803 on May 25th, in the last week of May. Also in the last week of May, hurtling back to the 20th century, but a while ago, May 27th, 1878, Isadora Duncan was born. I call her 20th century because she made her mark in the 20th century. Picture this. A five-year-old girl in what we would today call kindergarten uh, is in school and her teacher tells the class in December that Santa Claus has provided candies and cake as a special treat for the class. And a little girl says there is no such thing as Santa Claus. And when the teacher admonishes her and tells her not to be disruptive and that she has to believe in something, Five-year-old Isadora Duncan, according to her own autobiography, announces, I do not believe lies. Where'd she get these opinions from? From her own mother. Uh, she was the youngest of four children, uh, and her mother, Dora Gray Duncan, a pianist and music teacher, was devout, having been raised in an Irish Catholic family. But Dora lost her faith when her marriage fell apart and faced with four children to raise alone. Her faith in the Catholic, children, uh, the Catholic religion revolted violently to definite atheism and she became a follower of Robert Ingersoll, uh, the most famous, uh, agno the great agnostic of the
late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, Isadora's mother comforted her after that incident in kindergarten uh, by telling her, again, according to Isadora, and as much as I admire Isadora's uh, belief or non-beliefs uh, and attitudes, we have to take her autobiography with a double handful of salt. But anyway, supposedly Isadora's mother comforted her by saying, there is no Santa Claus and there is no God, only your own spirit to help you. And uh, as it is Isadora and her siblings sat at their mother's feet, she would, they were read the lectures of Bob Ingersoll. Uh, I'm assuming Isadora knew him, or of course she keeps referring to him as Bob. I wouldn't. Uh, she was dancing in public by the age of six. And uh, for those of you who've never seen the, uh, uh, the movie, uh, Isadora, uh, was a dance revolutionary of the early 20th century. Uh, she, long, she wore long diaphanous uh, white gowns and danced barefoot with her brother, uh, one of her brothers, and uh, she uh, um, convinced everybody that what she was doing was reawakening classical dance of the Greek and Roman period. Well, who could contradict her? <laughs> uh, but at any rate, um, she was doing interpretive dancing. And uh, she said that her dances were also inspired by the writings of uh, Walt Whitman and by Nietzsche. Uh, she found uh, her, most, her greatest fame in Europe, where she just wowed them. Uh, the Americans were a little bit more skeptical of Isadora and also uh, a lot less uh, tolerant of her uh, very definite atheist beliefs that she made no bones about. That didn't go over too well uh, in America, but in Europe was treated a little bit more, uh, a lot more tolerantly. After all, who cared what a dancer thought about God? Um, unfortunately, uh, she had terrible tragedy in her life. Uh, her two children, where she was on tour, and uh, her two children were in the back of the car, uh, a limo, I think, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, driver or the, or the chauffeur forgot to put the parking brake on the car, slid down uh, the incline of a pier, and went into the water, and her, both her children were drowned. Terrible thing to have happened. That happened in... Uh, 1913 and uh, colored the rest of her life. She continued to dance and she continued to work and then uh, in one of the most bizarre deaths of the 20th century um, she got on the back of a motorcycle with a uh, young man that uh, she had just picked up and uh, she always wore long flowing scarves and the motorcycle wheel spun, the scarf got caught in the spokes and Isadora was killed. Um, but she made a huge difference in American art and American uh, dance, and she inspired a great many other uh, others. And if she embellished her life, um, let's put it this way, she discarded many, many myths. And if she created a myth called Isadora Duncan, okay. Why not? And uh, we should all live such an interesting life without the tragedies. Uh, but we should all have that kind of an interesting life, uh, a productive and successful life. Uh, from dance to politics. On May 30th in 1814, Mikhail Bakunin was born in Russia. Um, he uh, went in the military like many young uh, middle class men of his time, uh, but he left to study philosophy and went to Paris where he met Marx, Karl, not Groucho, and writers uh, like uh, George Sand and Proudhon, and uh, got actively involved 
in the French and German revolutions of 1848. Um, these were uh, bloody, terrible upheavals uh, that rocked Europe in 1848 because the, the um, liberation that followed the American Revolution of 1776 to 81 and the French Revolution of, uh, to 91 or 92 before Napoleon took over, where all the changes that came about were gradually destroyed after Napoleon was finally defeated and uh, and the monarchies came back in some cases stronger than ever. Um, the concept of the rights of man and the individual liberties were pushed aside and eventually this meant now and then along with uh, the development of uh, international capitalism and a uh, growing working class uh, that was receptive to socialist ideas at the beginning. Uh, this exploded in revolution all across in '48, and uh, Bakunin was a revolutionary. And uh, in fact, he was there in 1849. Uh, the German authorities caught up with him in Dresden, and he was uh, arrested, convicted, and sentenced to death uh, for uh, treason. Uh, the death sentence was commuted eventually, and he was extradited to Austria, where he was tortured and beaten, convicted, and again sentenced to death. Again, it was commuted, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Um, and then he was extradited to Russia. Why all these changes, I really don't know. Uh, but uh, he spent 11 years in prison for escaping and made his way to Japan and the United States. Uh, and he lived in a variety of uh, different Western uh, European countries and uh, finally settled in Geneva. Um, he, his, his major works uh, include uh, the book Statism and Anarchy, in which he called for women's equality, free education, and the abolishment of hereditary property. Um, and his most notable uh, free thought essay was called God and the State, which he wrote in 1883, uh, in which he called Jehovah of all the gods certainly the most jealous, the most vain, the most ferocious, the most unjust, the most bloodthirsty, the most despotic, and the most hostile to human dignity and liberty. Take that, Jehovah. Uh, all religions, he wrote, um, in English as a matter of fact, uh, with their gods, their demigods and their prophets, their messiahs and their saints, were created by the credulous fancy of men who had not attained the full development and full possession of their faculties. Uh, did he... Uh, have any respect for any of the concepts? Yeah. Satan. The eternal rebel, he called them. The first free, free thinker and the emancipator of worlds. Uh, this manifesto of his uh, God and the State uh, maintained that as long as there is a master in heaven, humans will be slaves on earth. He died in 1876, but he was born May 30th in 1814. Mikhail Bakunin. Uh, oh, I forgot some of his quotes. Um, if God is, man is a slave. Now, man can and must be free. Then, God does not exist. A jealous lover of human liberty, and deeming it the absolute condition of all that we an admire and respect in humanity, I reverse the phrase of Voltaire and say that if God really existed, it would be necessary to abolish him. You may remember that Voltaire had said, if God didn't exist, we would have to create him. Bakunin said, if God really existed, it would be necessary to abolish him. 
Michael Bakunin, uh, born the last week in May in uh, 1814, on May 30th, as a matter of fact, this evening, uh, discussed Mikhail Bakunin, Isadora Duncan, Ralph Waldo Emerson, G.A. Wells, and my favorite American poet of all time, Walt Whitman. This is, has been Atheist History Week. I'm John Rafferty. I hope you'll join us again next week when we'll discuss uh, atheists of, who were born or died or achieved something important during the first week of June. Hope to see you then. Wherever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, and a Buddhist nation and a Hindu nation and a nation of non-believers.